Good evening and welcome to the West Virginia Bar Association Forum of Candidates for the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. I am Harvey Payton, the president of the West Virginia Bar Association and one of the facilitators for tonight's event. I want to say a few words about the West Virginia Bar Association, but first, given the fact that we're here in Charleston's capital city, I had asked Mayor Danny Jones if he would be kind enough to come by and welcome us. And Mayor Jones, if you'd care to step thank up here. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Harvey. And thank everybody for being here. And I'm the guy in the room without the college degree. So we're very grateful for this to be hosted in my hometown. And this is a very important race, both uh, segments, both this one and the one on Thursday night. And a lot of, uh, I think, very good candidates for us to uh, pick from. So this will be a learning experience for all of us, including me and the entire viewing audience and listening audience. So thanks for being here, and we're very excited. Thank you, Harvey. Thank you, Mayor, very much. The West Virginia Bar Association was founded in 1886 and is the oldest bar organization in the state of West Virginia. It is a voluntary bar association as opposed to the West Virginia State Bar, which came into existence in the 1940s and is mandatory for all practicing attorneys. Membership information is available online at our website. We primarily focus on activities that will promote the integrity of the legal profession, and I think tonight serves as an excellent example of that. I would like to thank our title sponsors for tonight's event. That would be the Kanawha County Bar Association, Frost Brown Todd LLC Attorneys, West Virginia Metro News, and the West Virginia Press Association Services Foundation, along with our other sponsors who are listed in the program and without whose participation this event would not be possible. Special thanks as well to West Virginia Public Television for broadcasting tonight's forum. This forum will be archived on the West Virginia Public Television website and available for viewing at your convenience through the website for the future. Harvey, the dean is here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Continuing legal education is an important part of the legal profession and the West Virginia State Bar his executive director, Anita Casey, just heard tell me that one of our moderators had arrived through traffic, uh, has approved this event for two hours of continuing legal education credit. If you are an attorney and you're here in person tonight, we need your name and bar number before you leave. If you're watching this event or watch it in the future, 
through the public television website or Facebook streaming. You can self-report those hours to the Supreme Court. It's two hours of CLE, one hour of which is, one half hour of which is in ethics. Our candidates tonight, and we'll get right to them, are seeking a two-year unexpired term on the court. This is a term that opened in July when Justice Ketchum resigned from the court. This unexpired term begins when the November 6 election results are certified and ends December 31, 2020. I would ask at this time, so we can all become familiar, that each candidate, as their name is called in alphabetical order, signify their presence to the audience by raising a hand. The first, seated to my extreme right, is the Honorable Tim Armstead, Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals in Kanawha County, West Virginia. Justice Armstead. Seated to his left is Harry Bruner, Jr. of Kanawha County. To Mr. Bruner's left is Robert Carlton of Mingo County. Then Ronald Hatfield, Jr. from Cabell County. Mark Hunt from Kanawha County. Hiram Lewis IV, Clay County, West Virginia. Then the Honorable Joanna Tabbitt, Judge, 13th Judicial Circuit, Kanawha County, West Virginia. Seated to the left of Judge Tabbitt, they tend to stick together, the judges. The Honorable Chris Wilkes, Judge of the 23rd Judicial Circuit, Berkeley, Jefferson, and Morgan Counties in our Eastern Panhandle, and Jeff Woods of Kanawha County. Questioning of our candidates will be by a panel of moderators. Our panel for tonight's forum are Dean Gregory Bowman. Dean is, Bowman is the William H. Mayer, Jr. Dean and Professor of Law at the West Virginia University College of Law, holding a Doctor of Jurisprudence from Northwestern University and degrees from Exeter in England and a degree in economics with honors from West Virginia University. Jeff Jenkins is our other panelist and examiner. Jeff is a 1987 graduate of the West Virginia University Pearly Isaac Reed School of Journalism. He heads the news division of West Virginia Metro News and is chief capital correspondent covering all major political events in the state of West Virginia. The format for tonight will be this. Each candidate at the beginning will have three minutes for an introductory statement. And the order of presentation will be chosen at random by selecting uh, names from this uh, container. The topic of these opening statements will be in the form of a self-inquiry, why am I qualified to serve as a justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals? After these remarks conclude, the panel will have a period of approximately one hour and 15 minutes to question the panelists, to question the candidates. The moderators will select themselves which candidate to whom they pose a question at any given time, and the candidate will then have two minutes to formulate and give an answer. We will say that no questions have been previewed in advance or disclosed to any candidate. Candidates, the one request we had from public television is be sure to talk into the microphone. Thank you. After this period of questioning, each candidate, again selected at random, will have two minutes to close and state their position. I will say for the candidate's benefit that these time limitations will be strictly enforced. We have a timekeeper who will notify you when you have one minute, 30 seconds, and 15 seconds of time remaining and will signal the close of your remarks with the sounding of a gavel, remarks should be concluded immediately. When we finish, at approximately 8 o'clock, there will be a reception in the Grand Hall to which you are all invited, and you will be able to meet and greet and interact with the candidates tonight. While the forum is going on, we would ask as a matter of time and decorum that you defer any applause or audible uh, signs of support for any candidate There'll be some applause at the conclusion, and then you will have time to meet and express your support in the uh, reception. Now, are you ready to begin? Right. So we'll begin with our opening statements. The first candidate to speak to the issue of why you're qualified to serve, and I'll do this one, and then the next will be by Jeff Jenkins and then by Dean Bowman, would be Joanna Tabbitt. Fair enough. So. Thank you, Harvey. And um, my, the reason I'm most qualified is, frankly, I'm a judge. I'm not a politician. I'm a lifelong West Virginian, and uh, I ran for public office, first for the position of circuit court judge, 
because I wanted to improve life for all West Virginians and that's why I'm running for Supreme Court. Because I believe that now, more than ever, our court needs a proven, qualified judge. And I believe it's critical that that person that's elected for the Office of Justice of the Supreme Court of Appeals possesses integrity, character, and fairness to help restore the public faith and confidence in the judiciary and to help lead the court in the next generation. And as a practitioner of some 28 years before I took the bench and for a circuit judge for nearly four years, I believe I possess those qualities. As a current circuit court judge and as an active litigator in state and federal courts for 28 years before that, I have spent my entire professional life in a courtroom. I've tried scores of cases. I have argued in front of the Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia, the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals for the United States, and briefed several cases before the U.S. Supreme Court. And immediately after law school, I had the privilege of clerking for Thomas McHugh, a justice of the Supreme Court of Appeals. And after leaving that clerkship, was employed by the Attorney General's office as the Deputy Appellate Attorney General and an Assistant Attorney General doing appellate work, practicing almost exclusively before the State Supreme Court. Following my tenure at uh, the uh, Attorney General's office, I joined the law firm of Steptoe & Johnson, where I was a trial lawyer in the Employment Division and also in the Litigation Division for 22 years before Governor Tomlin appointed me to the bench in 2014. I was elected in 2016 and have been pleased every day to take that bench and do the good work that the people of Kanawha County elected me to. During my tenure on the Kanawha County bench, I was appointed to the business court. I have most recently been appointed to the mass litigation panel. I'm a member of the Juvenile Justice Commission and I'm the presiding judge of uh, our juvenile drug court in Kanawha County. Uh, a vision, my vision for the court is simple. I believe our court should be accountable. I believe it should be accessible, effective, and responsive to the people that it serves. And I think what makes me uniquely qualified for this position is I'm the only person on this panel who has worked for the Supreme Court of Appeals, practiced extensively in front of the Supreme Court of Appeals, and have also had the distinction of being appointed on two occasions to serve as an acting justice. So I know firsthand the work of the court have done it and would be honored if the voters of West Virginia would send me back there to do that work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Picking out of our bowl, our next candidate to give remarks is Mark Hunt. Thank you, I'm Mark Hunt and uh, I think a person who is a Supreme Court Justice would be a, a well-rounded person. And I think over my 50 plus years of life, I've been through a lot of things and I've done a lot of things. Um, I've been a lawyer for almost 25 years. Uh, during that time I've represented over 5,000 clients in state and federal courts. I used to do mass torts, I used to do defective products. Um, I've been married for 20 years to the same woman uh, and we have two children, one uh, 14 and one 17. They're both at home. Um, I served 14 years in the state legislature um, and I was the, a nominee for the United States Congress in 2016. Uh, during the time I served in the state legislature, I was fortunate enough to hear the arguments and hear the, the, the committee hearings and the debate on about 3,000 bills that has become law. and. A hundred of a hundred or so were those were mine, but of those three thousand, whether I voted yes or voted no on them, I know what the legislature intend to happen with that bill, and I think that's a part of being a judge, which is interpreting the law and understanding where the law comes from. I think I have that ability. Uh, when I was a much younger person, I was I was asked by two different governors to t to take appointments on the circuit court. I was asked by Gaston Caperton back in the mid-90s and I was asked by Cecil Underwood sometime later for a second appointment. I turned them both down. It, it wasn't a time in my life to be a judge. I was young with babies in my house and a young wife and I didn't have the ability or the time to do that job which I think that I can do effectively now. Um, 
as we've already heard i think we need to bring back to the court integrity honesty and most of all trust i think that we need to trust our supreme court justices because if we don't trust the individual then we don't trust the decisions coming out of the court so those are the things i think i bring to the court a a rounded person not only a family man a former legislator a longtime lawyer who's represented thousands of clients and been in state and federal courts i bring a well-rounded life to the court and i think i can bring that level of trust back to the court thank you thank you next we will hear from ronald hatfield good evening everyone thank you for coming i'm ron hatfield i'm a lawyer from huntington where i live with my wife of 20 years and our two daughters who both attend public school in cabell county for the last 18 years i've spent much of my life in the courtroom i've represented criminal defendants in magistrate courts and circuit courts and before the supreme court i've represented criminal defendants who can pay me and those who cannot Defendants charged with crimes uh, from petit larceny to DUI to crimes for which they face the potential of life in prison. I've represented mothers and fathers in abuse and neglect proceedings. I've served as a guardian ad litem for the children in those cases whose lives are turned upside down. I've represented individuals facing commitment in mental hygiene proceedings. I've represented parents and children in proceedings before boards of education. I've represented brothers and sisters fighting over mom and dad's property. I've represented neighbors fighting over fences. I've represented clients in numerous civil cases, uh, such as a lady who comes to mind whose doctors failed to tell her she had cancer. And I've also represented doctors and dentists and nurses who were accused of medical negligence. I've prosecuted and defended cases in a wide range of issues, from personal injury to motor vehicle accidents, toxic torts, environmental law, construction law, and I've also read and analyzed and, and given advice on insurance policies, both insurance companies and those of us who pay the premiums. So why should I be your choice for uh, the West Virginia Supreme Court? Uh, it starts with my military background. I'm a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. Honorable service requires integrity, discipline, and accountability. I'm a business owner. Many years ago, I started a solo practice that developed into a small firm which eventually merged with a national firm and now we serve clients all over the country. Throughout all of those years, I've had financial responsibility. I've been personally responsible for millions and millions of dollars of my clients' money and my partner's money, without question. I know the value of a budget and I know the importance of reasonable spending. All of those things combined, my history of success, and honor has all been earned, never given. And tonight I have the honor of, of sitting here before you and asking for your confidence and your vote in restoring the court to what it should be, uh, a place of respect, impartiality, and consistency, and a beacon of justice for all the people of the state of West Virginia. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Chris Wilkes. Good evening. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you this evening. Uh, why am I most qualified? Well, I sit up here and I look, I have six times more judicial experience than this whole panel. I got out of law school in 82 and I practiced law with my father for 10 years in a typical West Virginia practice. Two-man shop, divorce in the morning, abuse and neglect in the afternoon, maybe a boundary dispute, and then a court appointment. So. I'm well versed in all aspects of the law as a practitioner. I was lucky enough 10 years after that to be elected a circuit judge in 1992 and I've served as circuit judge in West Virginia's largest and fastest growing circuit since that time. In that period of time, I've handled every type of case uh, that comes under our law. I've also had the opportunity on numerous and numerous occasions to sit as a acting justice on the Supreme Court of Appeals and I've authored opinions, re reported opinions uh, on the Supreme Court. I'm currently the Chief Judge of the 23rd Circuit and in that, uh, 
those of you may know our circuits growing so fast that I have overseen large judicial projects working with county commissions and trying to fund those projects so to those of you that have dealt with county commissions you know you have to be pretty frugal in getting the money uh, out of them to get the necessary accommodation so that we can ensure that justice is served to our citizens uh, <clears throat> in that I've also been in charge of the management for all the individuals working for the court in that circuit uh, one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that six years ago I was appointed as chairman of the business court division it was just formed and in that six years period we have developed a business court division that is recognized not only within the state but without the state for its expertise in the resolution of complex commercial cases I have found that that leadership role really gives me the opportunity and I think the necessary experience to go forward into the court and work with civility to get us back to where we should be. That is a respected, recognized body of justice for all West Virginians. Uh, I've been endorsed by Tea Party groups and Democratic executive committees uh, plaintiff's lawyers and defense lawyers and the reason is because they know how I am as a judge I'm fair and impartial with no personal or political ideology that will be presented when a case comes before me for interpretation so I ask for your support and thank you for the opportunity to discuss it with you today next we'll hear from Harry Bo Brunner jr. thank you I am the only candidate that has defined public service specifically on the back of my campaign card. If you go to BoBruner.com, there are 10 solemn pledges that I've made. And I have a master's degree in public administration, and that's just like an MBA, except it's focused on government accounting which it can be very arcane and abstruse we need transparency and that when you're in public service you have to be able to understand that budget to the extent that I've heard the sworn testimony and tried to get to the line items I can't understand it but my commitment to you is and the voters are the court of last resort under our constitution and if you when if you elect me i'm going to take a line item budget zero based budgeting and i've had clients in the private sector over the past 43 years using zero based budgeting combined with another tool cost benefit analysis I believe the budget can be reduced at least 30 percent but you have to understand it and I think I have the education as well as the prerequisite but my practice in representing both small and large businesses over this 43 year period has been to practice preventive law and design programs to keep them out of court the public service is so important that if you define it specifically and have measurables or metrics meaning that on the back of this card are 10 points if if I don't take a two hundred thousand dollar deduction from my Supreme Court salary if I'm elected and give it back to the taxpayers based upon the theory that in West Virginia when lawyers do wrong we have a victim reimbursement fund the, the client and we also have a crime reimbursement fund well that's my belief that a lot of people have seen my eight dollar law office furniture you don't need 
a fancy office or fancy decorations. Thank you. <clears throat> Next we will hear from Robert Carlton. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Robert Carlton from Williamson, West Virginia, former mayor there. I'm married to Karen Carlton now for some 35 years. We have two daughters. We have three grandchildren. Two of the grandchildren are currently in college, so you can have sympathy for me there. <laughs> and then my wife, uh, when she married me, we went to law school. In fact, uh, she went to Oral Roberts University with me. She taught there. And I got my law degree from Oral Roberts University. Oral Roberts University later became CBN University when they were consolidated. In addition to my law degree, I have a Master's of Business Administration degree from West Virginia University. I have four other college degrees, several of which are two-year degrees. I have 300 college hours, 150 of those are graduate level hours for law and business. I attended Southern West Virginia Community College in Williamson to start with and then Pikeville College in Kentucky. And because I didn't have money to to really do that at the time, it took several years to do that. I went to law school at the age of 30 and also took my two daughters with me as well as my wife and we put in that time. As I came back from law school, I was opening up a private practice of law and have done that now for some 33 years. I handle mostly personal injury and bankruptcy cases. Bankruptcylawoffice.com uh, is one of the sites, and voteforcarlton.com is a site that you may want to visit. In addition to my private practice, I was an assistant prosecuting attorney for several years, and I was child advocate for several years, both in conjunction with my private practice. After that, <clears throat> I continued with my private practice and handled all kinds of cases in criminal defense as well. Uh, as prosecutor, I prosecuted murder cases and as defense counsel, I defended murder cases. One of which uh, was fortunate enough to have a not guilty verdict in after the trial. Uh, murder cases are not always tried individually and that was tried with co-counsel as well. In addition to my employment, after law school, I, uh, <laughs> uh, excuse me, I got distracted looking at signs there for a minute. <laughs> uh, I, before I went to law school, I served as a magistrate in Mingo County, West Virginia, having been appointed by then Judge Robert Staker. I was appointed child advocate by Governor Arch Moore. I was appointed assistant prosecutor by Glenn Rutledge, the prosecutor. And I'm asking the people of West Virginia to appoint me now as your Supreme Court judge. Next we'll hear from Hiram Buck Lewis. Good evening. My name is Hiram Lewis and I am a I'm asking for your vote for Supreme Justice of the Supreme Court for Division One. I grew up in Welch, West Virginia and went to Weirton uh, during high school graduated from Weir High School in Weirden, West Virginia. I have four degrees from WVU, a BSBA in finance of, uh, and accounting. I have a JD in law and I have a master's in athletic coaching education. I have practiced in our state for 17 years now, mostly in private practice. I've, I was Senate counsel in 2002 and a JAG officer with the West Virginia Army National Guard. I'm a former Airborne Ranger who served with 3rd Ranger Battalion for three years in the 1990s. And after 9-11, I, I uh, became a captain and a JAG officer in the West Virginia Army National Guard. I was deployed in Operation Iraqi Freedom for a year from uh, February 2003 to, Mar uh, to March 2004. And I, while I was deployed, I served as a magistrate at Camp Cropper in Baghdad International Airport, and I also conducted Article 5 tribunals in southern Iraq at Camp Bukha. Uh, I 
also served at the 111th Engineer Group's headquarters and provided legal assistance to soldiers and uh, staff of the uh, command group, uh, 111th Engineer Group. While deployed, uh, we also established the first public defender system in uh, the nation of Iraq in the summer, in August. I, uh, when I came back, I helped with uh, Hurricane Rita and Katrina cleanup in New Orleans, Louisiana. I also served on flood duty. I have uh, pretty much handled all types of cases in my private practice, and I, uh, I'm admitted in state and federal courts in the state of West Virginia, and uh, including the bankruptcy courts and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals in Richmond, Virginia. I, I'm asking for your vote basically because I believe that we are facing a constitutional crisis here in the state of West Virginia, and I believe that we need a non-biased, non-partisan, fully 100% elected judiciary on the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. I've dedicated my life to that, or the next three years of my life to that, and I will work for you as hard as I can to see that vision come to fruition. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Tim Armstead. Thank you, Dean Bowman, and thank you for the opportunity to be here this evening. Um, throughout my legal career, judges have always been at the top of the list, or near the top of the list in terms of respect in all the polls that I've seen. And then recently, I saw a poll that said 54% of West Virginians either have little or no confidence in our state Supreme Court. And that's just something we have to change. When I talk to the people of West Virginia and they talk to me about what they want to see changed in the court, it's very important that they see honesty, integrity, and fiscal responsibility. And I believe I have the talents and the ability and experience to bring those things to the court. I've had uh, 28 years as a practicing attorney with some of the larger firms in our state. I've served 14 years of that term or that, that career as an in-house lawyer in, an, in the energy industry, which is such an important part of the economy of our state and such an important part of the cases that come before the court. I served as a law clerk for Judge David A. Faber and served as the assistant uh, to the chief of staff of Governor Underwood. And I think that experience, coupled with my experience in the legislature, 20 years serving uh, in the legislature, the last four of which was as Speaker of the House, what we need now, more than ever in our court, are people who have shown leadership and shown it with integrity. And I believe my experience, my work in the legislature has shown that I have a reputation of honesty, of integrity, of trying to bring openness to government to ensure that people know how their tax dollars are spent and how their government operates. And we need that. We need that desperately in our court now. I will bring that. I'm already, as in the last three weeks, I've been serving as a, as a justice of our Supreme Court after having been appointed to that position until this election. And I've already heard oral, oral arguments. I've already been working on writing decisions. But we've also been working on the budget and working on implementing policies to ensure integrity and fiscal responsibility to that court. I would love the opportunity to continue in that work because it is incredibly important to the state of West Virginia. It's incredibly important to the people of our state. They deserve a court they can trust, a court that is fiscally responsible, a court that will make them proud. And I believe I'm uniquely qualified to serve on this court. So I would certainly ask your support, ask for your vote, and let's take our court back for the people of our state. Thank you. And our final opening statement will come from Jeff Woods. The first shall be last, and last shall be first. <laughs> Amen. I am the most blessed and uniquely qualified candidate for the West Virginia Supreme Court. i tell you why. 
My first exposure to the legal system came when my mother was the cook at the Greenberg County Jail and my father was the janitor at the courthouse. From there, I graduated from high school, went to West Virginia State University, graduated with a degree in three years, magna cum laude in sociology. Studied counseling at the West Virginia College of Graduate Studies, moved on to Howard University, where I earned a JD, magna cum laude. My first child was born during my first year of law school. Nonetheless, I made it. We persevered. I then got out of law school, got a deferment from the Army to do a one-year clerkship with the state Supreme Court, which I did. That clerkship lasted as a clerkship solely for about six months. I was then elevated to become the magistrate or the acting director of the magistrate court system of West Virginia. I then wrote a lot of the procedures which are still being applied today. After that, I owed the Army some time. Had to turn down a clerkship with Judge Damon Keith because the Army wanted me. I went on to serve as a prosecutor for the 5th Infantry Division of Fort Polk, Louisiana. After that, I left the Army after my tour because I didn't want to go overseas without my children. Came back and became the first African American to work for a large law firm in the state of West Virginia when I joined Jackson Kelly. I stayed at Jackson Kelly for 25 years, having made partner. After my daughter graduated from medical school, I decided it was time for Daddy to get back and do what Daddy wanted to do, and that is serve the people of the state of West Virginia. Therefore, I have open my own law office. I would say I'm the most uniquely qualified because I've been everything in this system except the defendant. And thank God for that. But this much I will tell you. I've been a prosecutor, a corporate defense attorney, a civil defense attorney, a civil attorney on the plaintiff's side, and I have been down in the trenches. I've been a municipal court judge for the city of Nitro, and now I am running to do what I've always wanted to do, and that is to be a dedicated servant of the people. Very simply stated this, when God gives you a gift, if you don't use it to serve somebody else, he'll take it away from you. I want to be a dedicated person who is dedicated to serving this system. We need a justice who is ready to dedicate himself to serving people. Not only am I uniquely qualified, I'm diversely qualified. I can guarantee you this, I'll give you my absolute best. I owe no one but Lady Justice. So I want to serve and give equal justice to all people in West Virginia. Thank you and God bless. Now the, uh, we'll begin the period of questioning. The first question will be posed by Dean Bowman to the candidate of his choosing and then that will follow in alternating order between Dean Bowman and Jeff Jenkins. Gentlemen. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Woods, you patiently waited to give your introduction last. I will open by asking you the first question, which is, what is your vision for the future of our judicial system and what changes would you advocate for and why? My vision for our judicial system is that we get back to serving the Lady Justice. And we do that in a dedicated fashion. And I will tell you why. If you look at the statistics promulgated by the West Virginia Supreme Court themselves, the one conclusion that you must arrive or come to is this. They're not working very hard. Their own statistics show that they average signing about 100 written opinions per year. You look at, at the five justices, divide 100 by, tw by five, you end up with 20. On the other hand, you look at the number of resources or the amount of the resources that they seem to be squandering. You look at the caseload of the circuit judges, it's somewhere around or over 600 per judge. That tells me that there is a wrongful or inappropriate allocation of resources and personnel at the court. We need to take those resources, push them back down to the circuit court level, and if we did that, number one, we would be able to not rely on memorandum and procurium opinions, but give everything the attention of the justice that was elected by the people to decide cases. Good decisions coming out of the, out of the circuit courts will enable the Supreme Court to have a smaller caseload and not have time to squander resources, waste time, and sit around and have, do much of nothing. So my vision is, is that we become deliberate, we become active and we not be quasi legislators we just take care of justice and administering justice 
equally, fairly, justly, and appropriately for the citizens of this state. That's my vision, Dean. Thank you. Question for Joanna Tabbitt, and circuit judges across the state are weighed down by abuse and neglect cases, and it dominates uh, their caseload daily, uh, their workload daily. Uh, what can be done, or can anything be done by, because we have the opioid epidemic, we have so many things that have impacted the family, uh, what can the Supreme Court do in this area to help the circuit court system? And Jeff, that's a very good question, and you're right, because probably 50 to 60 percent of the circuit court docket is abuse neglect cases, and I would say um, the highest percentage of those, upwards of 95 percent, um, have a drug element to it. And uh, I think what the court needs to do really is, is what it is doing as it relates to juvenile drug courts and treatment courts like adult drug court, recognizing that essentially this, this is a health crisis that we're experiencing and incarceration is not always the answer. You know, that's not to say that there aren't people who commit crimes that uh, deserve to be in jail and also take drugs. I mean, that, that's an issue, ab absolutely. And what you struggle for in disposition in these types of cases is to differentiate between individuals who are addicts that commit crime to fuel their addiction and individuals who are frankly criminals with recreational drug habits. But I think the biggest thing our court can do with respect to the abuse and neglect issue is deal with the drug crisis as it has and, and frankly, um, more resources toward treatment courts because that, that reduces recidivism as it relates to adult offenders, it helps them with rehabilitation, and as it relates to juveniles, when we can engage them early on through a multidisciplinary process, it helps prevent them uh, from falling into the throes of addiction. Thank you. Mr. Armstead, you spoke of integrity in your opening remarks, uh, and I wanted to ask you to describe a time when you faced an ethical dilemma in your career and how you resolved that. That's a great question. Uh, I think as, as lawyers, as just individuals, you face those uh, many, many times in your life, uh, and I think you just have to have the basically the background that you are going to do the right thing and the determination that you're going to do the right thing uh, i think that you have to and it's not always easy to do the right thing i think we always all recognize that that sometimes uh, the easy route is to to not do the right thing uh, i think it's incredibly important when uh, we look at what we've been through over the past year that you have people on the court who have already shown that when they're tested and tried in difficult situations, that they do have integrity and they do have honesty. And they're gonna do the right thing, even if it's not the popular thing, even if it's not the thing that others may expect them to do. But doing the right thing is incredibly important. I, uh, you know, I've had a number, as my 20 years as a, as a legislator, there were many, many votes that uh, might have been easier and, and uh, you know, may have been more popular. But I knew that the right thing was to do a particular vote or to take a particular position. And uh, I knew that I needed to be able to go home and sleep well that night and be able to do the right thing was the only way that I could do that. And I truly believe that after 20 years in the legislature, I left that position, uh, you know, not always, uh, not to say you don't make some mistakes along the way, but I believe that I left it knowing that I had a clear conscience about how I conducted myself in that position. And I want to bring that same uh, conviction to do the right thing to our court. That que next question is for Mark Hunt. You're familiar with the legislative process and uh, familiar with what the legislature did a few years ago by making judicial elections nonpartisan elections. And of course, they, those most of the time will happen in the spring, not, not for this time. But sh there's been some talk about all of you candidates here, and you're all very qualified, but and all, all very confident. But I doubt if all, any of you are going to get 50%. It's just my thought. But <laughs> so, should there be my question for you, Marcus? Should there be runoffs in this state for judicial seats? Well, in this particular election, I don't think it's going to be possible because. Simply, we couldn't afford another election. Uh, but I think that 
given the perfect dynamic where this race is held in the primary election and should there be a very close vote in the primary election i know some states that have runoffs like louisiana you have to win by i believe by at least five percent and if you don't win by five percent then there's got to be a runoff election by the two top vote getters so theoretically if you have this 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 election and it's held in the primary then you're going and you have two close candidates maybe maybe they achieve less than five percent difference between them there certainly would be no cost or no problem with having a runoff election in the general because the general is going to occur anyway it's not going to cost any more money now indeed it will cost those candidates more money to keep running keep spending time away from their business etc but i wouldn't see any problem in the perfect world of having a primary with this nonpartisan election if a person didn't win by at least five percent have a runoff in the general election now in the election that we're that that's ahead of us now it's just not possible and frankly we're a poor state can't afford runoff so in the real world i think we could and under 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 better circumstances i think maybe we should thank you my next question is for mr carlton and my question is this how would you prepare yourself? You've had a wide-ranging career, but how would you prepare yourself to handle cases involving unfamiliar areas of the law? Well, <clears throat> unfamiliar areas of the law are unknown to me to some degree because over the last 35 years, I've run into just about anything that you can. As a solo practitioner, and you have five or six new clients come in during the day, and they tell you their stories, and you decide whether to take the case or not. It might be a mesh case, it might be a criminal defense case, it might be a, most likely a bankruptcy case, because I do a lot of those, or a personal injury case. Uh, I live on the border of Kentucky, so I have Kentucky clients. I'm licensed in West Virginia, Kentucky, and North Carolina. I've seen the diversity of situations, including <clears throat> situations with child abuse and neglect. As assistant prosecutor, I handled those for the state. And as defense counsel, I defended the parents or appointed as guardian ad litem to look out for the interest of the children. Those truly are the heart-touching cases. <clears throat> as far as cases that you may not be familiar with, whatever that might be that comes before the Supreme Court, the litigants will be briefing those cases and bringing the uh, Supreme Court judges up to snuff, if you would, on what's going on in that area of the law. And then the Supreme Court judges will be reviewing the law themselves and, and deciding what needs to be done. Criminal defense matters. Uh, you know, I've defended people there and one of the most recent cases I've handled was a gentleman who had been incarcerated on a 50 year sentence and he had to be released because while arguing an ex post facto argument to the judge they had enacted this law sentencing him to 50 years after he had committed the crime thank you Next question is for Chris Wilkes. Uh, recusals or lack of recusals have been controversial in recent years. Under what circumstances should a judge recuse him or herself from a case? When a judge feels that they can not impartially uh, decide the case, they should automatically recuse themselves. Uh, we at, at the circuit level, of course, someone files a motion, whether we agree with it or not, we then forward it to the Chief Justice for their determination. I think one of the problems that's gotten us uh, into some of the, the uh, ill repute, so to speak, with uh, the national bars, in fact, our Supreme Court utilizes what the U.S. Supreme Court utilizes by way of recusal, which is if I think I should get out of the case and I get out of the case, 
I wouldn't. I, I don't agree with that. I think you need to have someone else look at it, and I have uh, some proposals as to how that should be looked at. But you have to, as a judge, realize you have an overriding obligation to do your work. So you have to take the tough case and decide it. Just because you feel someone may not want you deciding it isn't enough. You have to. You have to work that dilemma out as to whether or not you feel you can fully, fairly, and impartially apply the law to the facts, and if so, you should stay in the case. If you have any hesitation that you may not decide that case based solely upon the law and the facts, then you should voluntarily recuse yourself from that case. And it's, uh, it's very easy to recuse yourself from a lot of difficult cases, but as a judge, you take an oath to decide those cases so long as you can do it fully, fairly, and impartially. Thank you. My next question is for Mr. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Lewis, one of the roles of a member of the Supreme Court is to be an administrator. And I'd like for you to describe for us this evening your administrative experience and what you think your primary strengths are as a supervisor and administrator. Well, first of all, I uh, have ran my own private practice and that's uh, been an administrative headache. <laughs> No, uh, honestly, the, um, I believe I'm, I'm uniquely situated in this particular instance because I have a background in finance and accounting and I understand the auditing process. I understand that there needs to be accountability set up. I understand that there needs to be uh, people that are in charge and not necessarily the Chief Justice. I believe that uh, the financial aspects of the office have been ignored. And I believe that it actually within our profession, there's not too many people that understand business and account uh, how to set up uh, proper accounting procedures and uh, tracking um, disbursements and expenses. And we've seen the uh, what that has done to our Supreme Court. I believe with my business background, I'm uniquely uh, situated to be able to run the administrative office uh, and the administrative aspects of the office and I also believe that there are um, challenges that we face administratively in this state we had uh, public defender services to find and along with uh, the state bar find that uh, lawyers were over billing on the voucher system and uh, they were actually billing more hours that exist in a day and there was at least 13 law firms or lawyers that were disciplined for that. And we need to rein that in, and there's no reason that the circuit judges should be involved in the appointment process. They're supposed to sign off on those vouchers and say that the expenses are reasonable and necessary, but obviously that didn't happen. And it's nearly impossible to do it. We have made some changes in that regard, but I believe we need to take the judges out of it. Thank you. Next question is for Ronald Hatfield. Um, a popular topic concerning the Supreme Court and the court system prior to the last year's developments has been talk, especially from the business community, about the creation of an intermediate court. Is such a court desirable or necessary? I don't believe it's necessary as long as the voters of West Virginia elect Supreme Court justices uh, who have integrity, discipline, dedication to the job, uh, and accountability to each other and to the citizens of West Virginia. I have concern over the, the costs associated with attempting to create intermediate appellate courts. I am not personally aware of uh, any backlog of cases or, or any uh, pressing reason uh, to have another avenue of appeal from the circuit courts. Uh, I believe the uh, Supreme Court uh, has the ability to handle the cases uh, that are currently coming out of the circuit courts. Uh, and with dedication to the job, uh, I believe that uh, intermediate appellate courts will be unnecessary at this time in West Virginia. Thank you. Uh, the next question is somewhat related, and it is for Mr. Bruner. Do you believe that the average citizen in West Virginia has adequate access to legal services and to the legal system? And if you do not, what do you think we should do to provide better access? My experience has been that if you complicate our court system with another layer, you are going to take away from the 
poor, disadvantaged litigants because it's just too expensive to litigate. And for the small businesses here, every small business client, and large one too, will root, they say, the worst experience in my life has been to try to do business with the litigation method. And my point is that we have a wonderful, simple court structure here. If we complicate it with another layer, then we have basically taken away many small businesses, sole proprietorships, from engaging in seeking justice. And that's what we want justice to flow down from a court system but with three layers we have a municipal court a circuit court trial court and then an appellate court now I practice law in two other states Florida and Kentucky and their their, their court systems are too complicated they're expensive and we don't have that here in fact we we have the ability to be the best court in the country if we just keep it simple. Don't price justice because Amos 524, let justice and righteousness flow from this court like a river. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to go back to Mr. Armstead on this question, a similar question that asked uh, Mr. Wilkes about recusals, and you stated your experience with the legislature and uh, being involved in so many votes and so many issues, and your experience with the uh, oil and natural gas industry. What is your position on recusals uh, as, a, as a Supreme Court Justice? Well, I think it's incredibly important that you follow the rules of judicial conduct when it comes to recusals. Uh, it, if you, uh, there are a number of different uh, criteria set forth in the rules themselves uh, about what constitutes basically per se reasons to recuse yourself. But there's also, uh, as, as has been mentioned, a broader uh, provision that says when you feel like you cannot act uh, in a position that you can be fair and impartial, that you should recuse yourself. And, and it, that does need to be balanced with your role as a judge to do the job. So uh, I, as, as you mentioned in the legislature, there were times when uh, I made motions to not vote on particular things because I felt like that those, uh, those matters uh, could be a conflict of interest or could at least appear as a conflict of interest. And I think all of us, uh, in whatever role we take, as, as uh, we should be fair and impartial and follow the rules. And I think the rules are, are pretty explicit in terms of when a person should recuse himself or herself from a case. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've already actually in the three weeks that I've, I've uh, been a Supreme Court judge have already exercised that, um, that duty and obligation to recuse myself from an issue because of just that very thing. So I think it's incredibly important that judges take that seriously. Uh, it's, it goes back to what we've talked about in terms of integrity, in terms of honesty, in terms of impartiality, and I would certainly take those, those obligations very, very seriously. Thank you. Ms. Tabbitt? As lawyers, we are members of a service profession, and voluntary professional and community service is a necessary commitment for persons who hold public office. Would you please tell us this evening what forms of, prof of voluntary professional community service or other volunteer activities you've been involved with in the past and also currently and also what you would do if you were a member of the Supreme Court? Thank you, Dean Bowman. Um, presently, as, as a judge, uh, some of the activities I have been involved in philanthropically and uh, community oriented are a little bit curtailed um, by our judicial canons and what we are allowed to do. Um, previously, um, professionally, I've been on the board of 
governors for the state bar, I've uh, been on a, a young lawyer uh, in the Young Lawyers Division of the state bar, active professionally here in our local and county bar association. I've been a board member for the YWCA. Uh, I was, speaking of access to justice, was a chairperson of the Access to Justice Foundation, which raised money for the Access to Justice Commission when the Supreme Court had established that. And I, and I hope, if I would be elected as Supreme Court Justice, that we would reemphasize the importance of access to justice, because I believe it is important that justice is convenient, affordable, and accessible to everyone. Um, also, I, I've been a member and a board member of the Kanawha County Public Defenders Corporation, uh, commissioner for the City of Charleston Human Rights Commission, and been involved in, in, in a lot of other activities prior to my appointment to the bench. While on the bench, I have been a member of the Juvenile Justice Commission, and uh, also in the presiding judge, at the uh, juvenile drug court. And these are things that we as judges do uh, because we want to do them. And we think that it's the best way we can do to promote justice for all persons. And uh, as a, a member of the community, I believe that that's important. And it's a way that we can do something as judges. And uh, it's community service is something that's been a big part of my life professionally as a judge and, and as a lawyer and just as a member of the community of West Virginians, frankly. Thank you. Thank you. This uh, question is for Chris Wilkes. Um, of course, the, the two-year seat came up first, and then the uh, seat that was held by uh, former Justice Davis. Why did you, and from the Secretary of State's office, those came so close together, they were going to allow candidates to switch if they wanted to. Why did you choose to uh, run for the two-year seat over the six-year seat? My plans had originally been to run for the two-year seat, and I thought I would stick with the plan that I had uh, so I continued on I not one to do much switching actually so I stayed uh, with what I announced I was going to do and stayed with it simple answer okay. <laughs> mr. Hatfield what are you had a you've had a broad uh, career with many experiences. What do you see as the potential challenges in moving from your current position into this new role as a justice on the Supreme Court? The challenges are uh, I'm certainly used to 18 years of being in a courtroom, uh, reading, analyzing, writing about, and arguing the issues on behalf of individual clients, one-on-one uh, -on -one interaction, and then uh, working uh, to attempt to reach uh, the results that my clients desire. Uh, the certain difference in being a member of the Supreme Court is uh, addressing the issues from a perspective that you have to realize that uh, the decisions affect all of the citizens of the state of West Virginia as opposed to one-on-one -on -one client interaction. So to uh, sort of maneuver from one-on-one -on -one client interaction to being in a position where you realize that you have the opportunity and the honor uh, to use the experience and the training and the skills that you've developed uh, through the profession that you've chosen uh, to affect the lives of all the citizens of West Virginia, I think will, uh, will be a, uh, an overwhelming uh, but honorable task. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Woods, and you described your experience in, in, in all different aspects of the court system. Um, a lot today is about public access and access to the court. West Virginia has made some advancement in that when it comes, I'm talking more about uh, public court records, how to be able to access them online. What can the Supreme Court do or what should it do to make sure that every public court record is available online in each county and from the state? I think there is a definite need for us to uh, begin uh, or to extend our involvement in implementing an e-filing system and a electronic case management system. However, what concerns me about that is responsibility. Responsibility with regard to citizens in West Virginia. We know what our demographics are, we know what our geography is. And unfortunately, there are still communities in West Virginia where access to the internet 
is not as accessible or as prevalent as we would like for it to be. So when we do it, we're going to have to go down deep and realize that there's a lot of work that's going to have to be done to our electronic infrastructure in order to make that plausible and make it effective. In addition to that, we have to realize that we are living in a world where things can be easily accessed and hacked. And therefore, we have an obligation to protect the privacy of individuals with regard to important issues. And therefore, we have to get involved. However, this is not a situation where we need to go blindly into that dark night because the federal system has a real good platform from which we can build, learn, and, and, and go forward. Therefore, it's my, it's my thought that we need to do it, do it responsibly, and do it with every citizen in mind. Mr. Hunt, I'm going to ask you a classic interview question, which is, what do you think your greatest strength is? And also, what about your greatest weakness? Um, it's an interesting question. Uh, <laughs> analyze oneself. Um, I think my greatest, my greatest strength, particularly for this job, is the diversity of person that I am. I mean, I feel like I've lived ten different lives during my fifty some years being on this planet. I, uh, I have. Um, been assistant prosecutor when I first finished law school. I um, I served in the legislature, ran for Congress. I've 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 done so many things that I think that gives me a well-rounded personality. You know, I've been a person who at times have made great deals of money. I've been a person who at times being a personal injury attorney, our income is like a roller coaster. Uh, some years I make a million dollars, some years I make none. So I mean, I've had a person that I understand what it's like to not have any problems paying your bills. I also understand what it's like not to be able to scrape enough money together to pay your gas bill. So I've been on both. I've been on both spectrums, and I've. Uh, I stay on both spectrums. So I think when you're serving in this job, you, you, you have to be able not only to look at the facts of the case and apply the law to it, which is most important, but you have to have the personality and the well-rounded ability to make some of the better decisions. Probably, probably my greatest weakness is I often have doubts in myself. I mean, I think you know, there's so many decisions you can make. I don't want to. I don't want to treat anyone unfairly. And sometimes you just have to say no. And for me, it's always been hard to say no. I've always tried to find a way out of getting around no. But sometimes you just have to say no, and that's hard for me. Thank you. Thank you. This next question is for Hiram Lewis, and this is. Uh, Hiram, one of the classic questions you ask at judicial forums. Uh, do you believe the state and federal constitutions are living documents that are open to interpretation based on changing circumstances, or do you believe in a more literal interpretation of the documents? It's a very good question, but uh, I have the answer. I'm a 100% strict constitutionalist. I believe in the documents as they are written. I believe in what they say. I believe in what they stand for. I am 100% uh, pure patriot when it comes to our Constitution, um, especially West Virginia's Constitution. If you look at the differences, uh, they learned something in those years that uh, from the time our federal Constitution was written to the time that our state Constitution was written. And, uh, you know, in, in, under, the, uh, under our Second Amendment on the federal Constitution, there's an argument about uh, the militia. You know, that's not in our state constitution. It specifically says we have a right to defend our home and family. 
in our state constitution. It also says that religious and political tests are forbidden or, or condemned in our state constitution. It is a beautiful document and uh, I love to read it sometimes just to, uh, to peruse it, just to um, remind myself how smart these individuals were when they gave us these inalienable rights. These are natural rights that the government doesn't have. The constitutional framework is actually set up to make us free individuals in free states in a free country and that's very very important and that's where my judicial philosophy starts and that's where uh, everything is looked through that prism because we are equal as individual people out here we are equal with our government there's not a the, the, the way a lot of people are taught uh, in this day and age that the government is stronger than the people the people are equal and we have any little rights that can't be infringed upon and uh, they're getting eroded away. They are getting eroded away. We got a, f a federal judiciary that says we can't, we don't have a right to have an AR-15 because it's a weapon of war. Well, it, in the Bundy case, that AR-15 is what kept them from getting shot by snipers from their own federal government. So we need to protect these rights, and I support them 100%. Strict constitutionalists. Thank you. Mr. Bruner, you talked in your opening remarks about public service. Um, I like the idea in your business card. The, uh, you talked about reducing the budget and transparency. So let me um, take a different tack on that. Uh, obviously, you've been inspired by a need to do things differently, and perhaps you've been inspired by judicial role models. Who are your judicial role models, and why are they your judicial role models? Oliver Wendell Holmes, John Marshall, the definer of the Constitution, and I would say Justice Kavanaugh, are exemplary role models that I would want to use from analyzing cases in what would be my decision-making process based upon those three justices. John Marshall was the second longest serving justice great legal mind and he is the definer of the United States Constitution but to go further than that the work ethic that Justice Kavanaugh talked about in his confirmation hearings uh, I am a hard worker I've played sports my whole life and hard work pays off but to hear his analytical method of deciding cases was very, very instructive to me. Thank you. For Mr. Carlton, let's go down this road a little bit of, of election of judges and justices. West Virginia is one of 38 states that elects the members of its state Supreme Court or elects for retention after original appointment. Should the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals be made up of members who have been elected or appointed and should that be done by congressional districts to give a better uh, maybe representation of the whole state? Well, there's absolutely no question that your judges need to be elected. Uh, back when this was becoming a country, Part of the problem was the English judges were terrorizing the colonists. And the judge was appointed by the sovereign. And you lived with it. And that was part of the reason for the revolution. And we do not need to have appointed judges. We need to have elected judges. You need to decide. And if they're a little bit off the rocker or if they're uh, the best in the world, then you need to make the decision. And, you know, <clears throat> our liberty is at stake. 
with appointed judges. You have then perhaps the governor making the decision for the judge who goes to jail. Obviously that shouldn't be, and I'm not saying it happens, but that's a possibility, and it used to happen. And so you don't want to ever give up the right to elect your judges. It's a tough process. It shouldn't go on forever. There has to be finality to it. Uh, I don't think there needs to be appeals and runoffs and things of that nature. I think it, the, the races for the circuit judges and all were shortened to keep the judges from having to spend all year campaigning and trying to garner votes for the next election cycle. Judges don't need to be involved in that they, any more than necessary. And that's why judges have campaign committees. If they're going to go out and solicit campaign funds, the committee has to do it. And theoretically, the judge doesn't know who their contributors are. And the judge should not himself be asking in open court, are you supporting me in the election before they sentence your defendant? And unfortunately, over 35 years, I've, I believe I've seen that. Thank you. Mr. Welts, based on your experience, what is your view on the pros and cons of mediation and arbitration and other forms of alternative dispute resolution, either as something in support of the rule of law and dispute resolution or something that undermines the development of law? Well, <clears throat> I believe firmly in alternate dispute resolution. Uh, both mediation and in arbitration, our court systems are burdened now and, and the mediation, which is purely voluntary as to whether or not the case is going to resolve itself, uh, really helps in taking some of that backlog off the cases. And it allows outside the box resolution of cases, whereas if you go to trial, you're stuck with what the law allows by way of a resolution. Uh, I also, and I've run into this in the, the complex commercial side, recognize that uh, you're entitled to a trial by jury, but oftentimes the issues have gotten to the point now, and, and the famous case is the Samsung Microsoft case where after six months of trial, the four person handed a note over to the judge and said, Judge, if we had a couple computer scientists and accountant and some others, we might be able to understand what you all have been talking about for the past six months. And so we, we realize that. And, and interestingly enough, even in the 30s, there's a, a, a line of scholastic work that talked about you have a, a constitutional right to a trial by jury. But does that mean that we have become so complex that you can't get a fair jury now? And that's why there's a, a big argument going forward as to whether or not we should be looking for specialized juries instead of impartial juries. Traditionally, we've looked for someone that knows nothing about the subject and can keep an open mind and learn. But my business court work, and, and I serve as the uh, vice chair of the ABA ADR section on for corporate and business litigation, there's a big mo movement towards allowing specialized uh, things. So arbitration allows you to do that. Thank you. Let's go back to Mr. Armstead for this question. You mentioned you've been a member of the court uh, for three weeks and in the controversy of the last year, uh, what we've learned through reporting and, and other information, um, it seems to be a uh, attitude at times of entitlement at the court. Um, just look at the expenditures for the office and those different types of things. Seems it's a separate but equal branch of government. We realize that, but uh, it, but it's the top of the profession in West Virginia. You could consider that. Uh, how should justices stay grounded, or how can they stay grounded uh, and not let that position? you know, the, the eliteness of it, if that's a good word, uh, impact them? Well, that's, that's a, uh, a tremendously important question right now. Uh, I think it, it's important for you uh, in any profession, particularly though when you have the opportunity to serve on our state's highest court, 
that you have to continually remind yourself day after day that you're the servant of the people and it's not the other way around. And that may sound a little cli like a cliche, but I think it's, uh, it's something that I learned in the 20 years that I've served in the legislature. Uh, because when I became the Speaker of the House, you know, there, there are certainly people who want to uh, say nice things about you all the time and, and uh, curry favor. And uh, you realize that uh, very quickly in those positions that um, you, you, again, you're the servant of the people. And you're not there for you. You're not there for your own good. You're not there to have accolades uh, in, in terms of self-aggrandizement you know, or anything. You have to realize that you're put there for the purpose of serving the people of your state. And that they have entrusted you with a very important and very serious obligation. And I, I think it's, it's something you need to remind yourself of every day. And I know when I would come into uh, the Capitol, a lot of days I would look up at that dome and I'd realize, you know, what an honor and privilege and, and uh, responsibility I'd been given to represent the people that I had represented in the legislature and to be the speaker. And I think you just have to keep grounding yourself and hopefully you have a family like I have who grounds me and make sure that, uh, you know, anytime I start thinking uh, good of myself, hey, it's time to take out the garbage or it's time to mow the lawn or something like that, you, you really have to be grounded. Just, and I think that comes from your own upbringing and your own beliefs and your own family situation in so many ways. And we, some we certainly have to guard against, uh, but I think that's what you need to look at in terms of people's background when you select a candidate for this office and whether they've shown that they are grounded in that regard. Now I'd like to follow up with that with uh, Joanna Tappet to answer that same question. And I also think that uh, it's important for the court to be very accountable to, to the people it serves. And I, I think that oftentimes judges, judges are accused of, of getting robitis. And, uh, and, and sometimes that happens, but, but I certainly hope that I'm the kind of a person that people would have an appreciation of. People that know me know that I'm an individual of integrity, uh, honesty, fairness, and uh, I apply basically a very well-balanced approach to my life, frankly, into the cases that, that appear before me. And uh, I would do that, I do do that daily as a circuit court judge, and I would bring the same value system, the same work ethic, the same integrity and character to the Supreme Court. Thank you. Mr. Woods, I'd like to ask you a question I asked a few moments ago to Mr. Bruner, which is whether you believe that the average citizen in West Virginia has adequate access to legal services and the legal system, and if not, what should we do to provide better access? Judge Leonard Hand once said that everybody has a right to be heard. However, that right will be meaningless if you don't have adequate representation. That's why I have lived my life with that principle in mind, that people need not only to have access to the system, but they need meaningful access. And sometimes that means being involved with someone who is skilled, knowledgeable, and capable. And I can say that I believe that wholeheartedly. As you know, the State Bar gives out uh, the Kaufman Award or the award to the lawyer who in any given year donates the most services to indigent, underprivileged people. I've won that award three separate times. And that's because I will always remember from whence I came. And I can tell you I grew up knowing that without the access to the system, I probably wouldn't be sitting on this dais today. Why? Because the very Constitution said that we were two-thirds two, uh, two of a person or three-fourths of a person, three-fifths, I'll get it right in a minute, three-fifths of a person. The bottom line is this, we need access to the system to ensure that all people are, as the documents of history say, created equally and endowed with certain inalienable rights. And therefore, I believe absolutely that everybody should have access to the system. Believing that, I would be one who would fight continuously to ensure that our system provides that access. It's a question for uh, Mr. Hunt, uh, serving several years in the legislature, um, and uh, so you know, you know the legislative process. 
do you support or oppose the constitutional amendment on the ballot next month that would give the legislature oversight of the judiciary's budget? And if so, do you have any concerns about that knowing, knowing both sides? Thank you. I've, I've actually given that, that amendment a great deal of thought. Our state constitution clearly says that the power to tax will reside in the legislature. So our founding fathers gave the purse strings to the legislature. Uh, the legislature already has power to oversee everyone else's budget, including the governor. Um, the legislature is directly responsible to the citizens of West Virginia. And what I mean by that is every two years, you can throw your legislator out. If you don't like what they're doing, you can throw it out, throw them out. And that, that is a, a concept that came through the Federalist Papers. I too have a master's degree in public administration. I've read the Federalist Papers. And because of that, I know that what our founding fathers wanted was carried over into our constitution in West Virginia is they wanted legislators to be directly responsible to, to the public and legislators are. So I see nothing wrong with the legislature having some oversight over the Supreme Court budget like they have some oversight over everyone else's budget. It only makes sense. Uh, and I think it's almost constitutional, even though the power to tax and the power to oversee a budget is slightly different. But we're still talking about the state's purse strength. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Tabbitt, in your opening remarks, you talked about the importance of being accountable and effective and responsive. And I'd appreciate it if you would think about those, those dimensions in the context of drug courts. What is your view on drug courts, how they should be changed, improved, or otherwise modified? Oh, I'm a big advocate for drug courts um, and I'm the presiding judge in Kanawha County's juvenile drug court and you will see statistically if you if you examine adult drug courts nationally and juvenile drug courts nationally that when they're appropriately implemented and thoughtfully implemented they work. Um, our model in in West Virginia with respect to juvenile drug courts is a little bit different than the national model. Um, we basically are proactive. Um, the, the youth that we deal with are not in full-blown addiction but show signs of that and apply a multidisciplinary approach to it using education, probation services, mental health professionals to combat and deal with those issues and, and hope that the children are engaged, um, that they succeed in their education and that they get away from the issues that are causing them to be at least attracted somewhat to, to those types of issues. Um, with respect to adult drug courts, you'll see that it cuts down on recidivism and obviously we are working toward getting them out of the throes of addiction as well and what we work to do is get them employed, wrap around community services and get them basically to return to healthy productive members of society and it helps not only the individual but it also helps the family and the statistics really bear this out incarceration really isn't the answer to our problem regarding addiction we have to educate one another and under have an understanding that uh, addiction really is not a choice it it is a disease and the treatment courts really go a long way in recognizing that and helping through that process thank you this is for Mr. Wilkes. You have uh, noted your experience. And what is the biggest issue facing the judicial system of West Virginia now and for the next five years, five to 10 years? Well, I think the biggest issue right now is to restore uh, confidence in our highest court. The tragedy over the last year or so has been that there are over 250 good, honest, decent judicial officers who go to work every day when our magistrates, our family court judges, and our circuit court judges that are all painted with that same brush. So I think uh, getting, getting the integrity and the reputation of the court back is, is the number one issue, but 
further on that i think an equitable distribution of the resources of the court so that all the counties equally share in the necessary resources be it technology be it working with the drug courts the day report centers ensuring that there's sufficient judges in the various circuits sufficient magistrates is a very important aspect of it so that i think would be the, the major matters now let me go to the other side of the bench then to Mr. Hatfield. If you could ask, ask that same question from the practitioner point of view. What is the biggest issue biggest facing issue. the yes. courts? Yes, sir. Currently and, and for the next five years, I certainly agree. I mean, the, the biggest issue and uh, I think what has brought 10 of us here uh, fighting for this seat uh, is the uh, questioned uh, credibility of the court and the fight to restore that and uh, the opportunity that each of us has to try to convince you as to why we're the right person for that uh, we can all sit here and tell you that we have integrity and discipline and accountability and we're going to work hard to restore that to the court uh, but what do you have to ensure that uh, and, and I will tell you for me it's my word and it's my history uh, dedication uh, you know as a veteran of the US military uh, in order to maintain that once we get someone on the court uh, that you have chosen to believe is by continuing to do the things that I think our court has done uh, pretty well over the last 10 years when I first started uh, practicing law uh, West Virginia was usually at the top if not then they were near the top of, of what was termed a judicial hellhole uh, and it was a uh, viewed as a pretty bad place for certain types of, of parties uh, but over the last 10 years, I think the court, as far as the opinions, uh, have worked hard to relieve West Virginia of that title. Uh, so we need to continue to do that and to work hard uh, to make sure that West Virginia is a place where there's fairness for all litigants uh, and that the decisions of the court are not influenced by any political party or agenda. Thank you. Mr. Hatfield, um, I'm going to ask a question that I've asked another panelist before, which is, um, if you would please describe for us a situation in which you took a controversial position um, and explain how you handled that. So, and with controversial position, uh, we're assuming that you perhaps angered or offended some people. How did you handle yourself in that position? Angered or offended some people. Was that the question? Yes. And you're free to say, I never have. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm sure I've angered and offended plenty of people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have a, a recent situation where I had a, a client I was representing, and as part of my, my practice, I uh, am hired by insurance companies to represent their insureds. And, and a situation arose where I had defended the client uh, for a number of months, and then that client uh, suddenly received a letter from his insurance company saying that they were no longer going to defend the case uh, and no longer going to pay me to be the lawyer and then instructed me to uh, to withdraw from the case and I, I found that to be uh, improper uh, because I disagreed with the decision and although I represented uh, the insured I, I was going to continue to represent that party so I, I angered the people who were paying me uh, without concern for whether I was going to continue to be paid for that for the work for that client uh, and ultimately um, continued to represent that client and, and did my job and dedicated my time and my effort to, to who I understood to be my client uh, and that was the person I was representing, the, the defendant in the lawsuit uh, without concern for whether I was going to be paid or for whether I was going to anger people who paid my bills at that time or on down the road. Thank you. This question is for Mr. Lewis. Do, does the Supreme Court need a new policy on senior status judges? And what was that? Does, does the Supreme Court need a new policy on senior status judges? No, I just think we need to work under the current, uh, you know, d don't hire them as independent contractors, and if they get to $126,000 a year, they need to stop or cut, cut back, I mean, I don't, I don't see why we have to pay anybody over 126 I guess we're 
applying for a job that's 136,000. But um, that's plenty enough for the job that is at hand, and I believe that uh, they, the senior status judges uh, should be limited to what the circuit judges make. Under the current system, that's what it is. I believe that uh, that's a good uh, a good system. If if there is any need to uh, go over that, there may be the need for some type of panel that has to prove it uh, with the auditor involved and uh, or the auditor's office involved. I believe that, uh, that what they did to skirt the rule uh, should be a front to all taxpayers of West Virginia. Mr. Brunner, we've talked a lot about the challenges facing the judicial system of West Virginia. How would you, um, in a way that is unique to you, work to restore faith of West Virginians in the Supreme Court of Appeals? Lead by example. Set a standard that nobody can match in the country. And I've spoken to judges in other states, and there are some really bad images of our court. I saw a poll the other day. We're number 50 in terms of reputation for integrity, honor, all the conflicts with the rec recusal problem that uh, in this case, you really have to be careful what we do if I'm elected on the front of the state capitol above Lincoln there's a Bible verse Proverbs 3 3 get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding and we seem to have gone to the other side where we're not getting at least the type of wisdom to restore the integrity of the court. There's been talk about this senior status. Uh, I have represented government clients and the quickest way to get yourself in trouble is be use creative accounting and it's it can be career ending as it has almost been here. Don't don't uh, play fast and loose with the rules. State purchasing, I know purchasing law. I've litigated the biggest case under state purchasing law in West Virginia. And you just simply, if you want a career in an experience, use creative purchasing practices, stringing. And I've told clients, don't do this. Don't do it. Thank you. This is, uh, this is our final question. This is for Mr. Carlton. You mentioned how you ha are licensed in several states. And I asked Mr. Woods this question earlier about uh, every public court record in West Virginia available online. Uh, is that something that uh, other states do better than West Virginia? And, and how can West Virginia do a better job there? Well, this is something that's been going on in federal court for decades now, and, and that is you know, access to <coughs> records through the Internet. Uh, as a bankruptcy attorney, I sit in my office and I file bankruptcies from Fifth Avenue in Williamson, West Virginia. I don't have to go to Charleston to do that. And it can be done in a matter of seconds once all the paperwork's ready. And I know how to do it because I have to teach my secretaries how to do it. It raises the skill set of the people that work for lawyers. They have to know more about what they're doing, how to operate computers, how to run the programs. And when they first implemented the federal practice, uh, I had people working with me. I had six paralegals at that time and some support staff. And the support staff became almost obsolete because we quit making a bunch of copies and mailing them to court. and to be filed and, and these kind of things. That became an unnecessary event. And it could be in West Virginia as well. Uh, Kentucky's struggling with that change over now. I think it's coming eventually. West Virginia, you can buy into a program, a service that's provided as an attorney, 
and have access to circuit court documents. Uh, it needs to be limited only to your clients. You don't need to be looking at abuse and neglect cases for your neighbor, right? Or what's happening to their children or how they got raped last week. That's none of your business. And as long as the press understands that and the people understand that, we can implement public access to records under the limitations that it needs to have. That uh, will conclude the questioning portion of our forum. Now, each candidate, I encourage you again to speak into the microphone as you deliver your remarks. Uh, again, random selection of an order, and each candidate will have two minutes now to uh, wrap up your and state your position with regard to your canvas. Thank you. And we'll go back to Mr. Carlton for the close. Yes, I want to thank you all for being here. I know it took a lot of time and effort, and I need you to vote for me on Election Day and everyone that's in the television audience. Vote for Carlton.com. Uh, when I was in law school, I received the American Jurisprudence Award in Insurance Law, a designation by my professor that I was a top student. The same in wills, trust, and estates. I applied to the West Virginia Board of Bar Examiners before graduating law school to take the bar exam earlier based upon my grades. They gave me permission to do that. I had already passed the West Virginia Bar when I graduated from law school. And you've got to look at the credentials of the people. You've got to elect honest people. You've got to elect people that are going to do what they tell you and have only one thought in their mind and that is right is the only way to do it there is no politics and you know the problem is a lot of the judges have to be elected in order to do that now I'm also a former member of the West Virginia Board of Governors and in that capacity there's a, a duty imposed upon that Board of Governors to oversee things like this and I, I problems with Supreme Courts and so forth, I think they should be more vocal on, especially the president of the West Virginia Bar. And they are privately and they're aware, and they would want you to select people that they don't have to watch every moment, that they know, people that have spent 35 years, 17 of that in public service. and have successfully done it, stand here at the age of 65 years old, telling you that I'm ready to be your next Supreme Court judge. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Jeff Woods. I'm running for position on the state Supreme Court for one very simple reason. I'm in love with a beautiful woman. I'm in love with a beautiful woman who has a beneficial disability. And that beneficial disability is blindness. I'm in love with that beautiful woman because her name is Blind Lady Justice. In our nation, we have gotten away from justice for all. We've gotten away from equal justice for all. We've gotten ourselves into a position where some people believe that positions such as being a justice or a judge is one in which there is a license to engage in self-grandizement, self-advancement, and self-enhancement. I am running because I have a desire to serve. I have a burning desire to serve. I am one who came from humble beginnings, and I have risen to a level that many thought I should not have. When you start to school in a segregated elementary school six years after Brown versus Board of Education, and you go on to earn a PhD, then you have worked, and you have a duty to return. To whom much is given, of whom much is expected. And therefore, I believe right now that there is something that I can offer. We began court 
in just about every court in our state with a prayer that says, God bless the state of West Virginia and this honorable court. I will every day add to that prayer, God, please keep me beneficial and honest. Thank you. Next we'll hear from Tim Armstead. Well, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity to be with you this evening and with my colleagues here on the stage. Uh, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be a Supreme Court Justice over the last few weeks. And as I sat on the bench in the Supreme Court chamber, as we sat there and we looked back on the back wall, along the back wall was a quote from Lincoln's second inaugural address, firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. What the people of West Virginia are looking for are people who will be firm and do what's right. That's what they're asking. That's not a lot to ask, really, but unfortunately, they've been let down. And it's time to rebuild the reputation of this court by fulfilling that obligation to do what's right and to be firm in doing what's right and to be fair. I have a long history of public service, and in that that uh, opportunity that I had, the honor that I had to serve in our legislature. I truly believe that I've done it with integrity, with honesty, with fiscal responsibility, and I believe that those who have dealt with me in those 20 years, uh, while not always agreeing with me, believe that I, you know, in most part, believe that I have done that. And for that reason, a number of groups have supported me in this, including such groups as Business and Industry Council, Farm Bureau, West Virginia for Life, NRA, a number of different groups, because they know that I'm fair, that I'm honest, and I'll do what's right. It would be a tremendous pleasure and honor for me to continue as your state Supreme Court Justice, to continue the work that we've already begun and every day that we do it right and we do it with integrity, that's one day closer, one day closer to restoring the reputation for integrity and honesty that the people of West Virginia deserve to have in their state Supreme Court. Thank you. Next we will hear from Mark Hunt. Thank you. It's been a pleasure and an honor to be here today, thanks to the Bar Association. Um, I think what we're talking about here is trust, once again. We need to have a Supreme Court that we trust our justices. A Supreme Court said we trust our justices and we trust their decisions and their opinions. opinions. Uh, we're here because there has been a misappropriation or perhaps a misuse of funds. Like Attorney Hatfield said a few minutes ago, anyone can come up here and tell you that they're going to serve with integrity. They're going to serve and not misuse funds. They're going to serve with trust. But the only way to prove that is by what you've done and what you're going to do and your actions and who you are. I served 14 years in the state legislature and during that time I had zero expenses. I never turned in an expense voucher. I never went on a legislative junket. I never bought a meal. I never asked for a lamp. I never asked for a rug. And I was a committee chairman and a member of rules. I never asked for anything. I was always happy with the hand-me-downs. So during the, fifth, so the, during the 14 years that I represented most of Kanawha County in three separate districts, I didn't misuse anybody's money. And that's on record. Thank you for having me. Next up is Ronald Hatfield. Uh, thank you, the Bar Association, and, and thank you uh, all for coming tonight. Um, during this last eight or ten weeks, or what seems like a year of campaigning, uh, I, I get asked the same question quite frequently. Uh, people say, yeah, Ron, we, we understand you're a veteran and you go to lots of courtrooms, but what do you stand for? And, and a, it's a difficult question to answer uh, because we cannot talk about uh, political issues or even legal issues uh, which may come before us as if we're on the Supreme Court. Uh, what we can tell people are the things like we've told all of you here tonight. Uh, and, and it's a tremendous opportunity to be able to spread that message uh, beyond our local county or bar associations 
uh, to more of the citizens of West Virginia so they can make a sound decision. Because let's be honest, I, I would say very few people who voted in the 2016 election actually knew anything uh, about the people who wound up on the Supreme Court. Uh, I hope that I've been able to convey to everyone here tonight that I'm not a plaintiff's lawyer, I'm not a defense lawyer, I'm not a politician. I'm a lawyer dedicated to an impartial judiciary without influence by any political party or agenda. I'm a business owner, so I understand the issues that are important to those of us out there fighting to make a living every day. I have years of proof of financial responsibility handling money that belongs to people other than me. Responsible spending and dedication to a consistent and impartial court is what I stand for. I thank you all for your time, and I would appreciate your confidence in your vote on Election Day. Thank you. Next, we will hear closing remarks from Joanna Tabbitt. Thank you. And thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and, uh, and engage in this dialogue. I believe our court is in crisis, and there's been a lot written over the last month about months about lavish spending practices, indictments of justices, unprecedented impeachment proceedings. Our state's history is really being written every day in headlines. And, and I've said it before and I'll say it again that now more than ever our court needs a proven qualified judge. It needs somebody that possesses fairness, integrity, and character to restore the public's faith and confidence in the judiciary and frankly to lead our court into the next generation. And you know the work of our court impacts each and every one of us, all West Virginians. And with everything going on at the Capitol right now, it's easy to be distracted and, and forget that there is a huge docket of critically important cases to be heard right now. Cases of importance to litigants concerning termination of parental rights, child custody matters, criminal cases, civil cases, all that require interpretation of state law that have potentially far-reaching implications. And, and I can't stress that justice of the Supreme Court of Appeals is, is not a job for on-the-job training. And I am a person that can do it and hit the ground running. I'm a circuit judge. I do that every day in my practice and what I do. I prepare for cases. I take the bench. I decide cases. And I decide the, the very types of cases that are being decided by our Supreme Court every day. And you know what, there's a cloud over our judiciary right now, but there's a silver lining to it because voters are engaged and thinking very thoughtfully about who they're going to elect to the state Supreme Court. And I'm confident that they're going to elect people who possess integrity, character, and the qualifications to do that. And I certainly hope that they will give me the opportunity to serve the people of the state ably. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Mr. Bruner. Thank you. This is the most important election in our 155 year history. And I'm asking voters to come out in three weeks. From tomorrow, we will have a new justice on the Supreme Court. I want you to look very, very closely because we have passed the summer of discontent. And we're not going to have a winter of despair. Good times are ahead of us, and all these candidates are good candidates. I believe I'm the best to do the job to bring change to the court by leading by example. And if times are tough in West Virginia now, we can look back in American history 241 years ago, the United States was fighting a war for independence and we had one of the greatest battles won this week at Saratoga and in perspective if you don't come out and vote and I'm asking all West Virginians uh, I've raised four kids I know the value of a dollar I know how to do budgeting but that's just part of the administrative role. Justice has to roll out of that court like a river. And only the voters can restore as the court 
as the court of last resort it's you watching this tonight and all the other West Virginians on November 6 please come out and vote because this is the most critical election in our state history thank you Next, we have Mr. Lewis. Yes, with my great, I'm an eighth generation West Virginian, and when my great 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 grandfather settled in this area, it was actually the state of West Virginia. He lived through a civil war and he fought for the Union, and he did that because he agreed with Abraham Lincoln that a man should not earn his bread by the sweat of someone else's brow. He voted for Abraham Lincoln before the war and then he had, and then during the war he voted he cast his ballot for Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln actually created this state in 1863 and since then we've come a very long way. Our forefathers championed a free independent state and that's what we need in our judiciary. We need a free independent judiciary that is nonpartisan, non-biased and 100% fully elected. That is what I am champion. That is what I'm dedicated to doing. I want to sit on that 100% uh, elected nonpartisan court uh, for the first time in the history of West Virginia. And we can do that by the, as early as 2020, in my opinion. And I'm committed to that challenge. I believe it is so vital and so important that we must act now. And. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of this of that scene in the in the movie Glory, where Trip has got so much hate in him, and he's sitting in the, uh, by a creek or uh, by a river, and the sergeant major comes to him and he says, uh, asks him to carry the flag, and he doesn't want to carry the flag, but the one thing he did say is, it's time to ante up and kick in because we're all dirty from this. We're all dirty from the politics of the past. We're all dirty from the for former Supreme Courts that have decided based on who your family is or who, what party, po political party you belong to. It's time for a change. It's time to fix it. It's time to ante up and kick in. Every one of you who's supported me in the past, if you support me now, we can win this race and we can bring in a nonpartisan, non-biased judiciary. And we'll end with Chris Wilkes. Again, I'll say last but not least, <clears throat> experience is vital. Why is experience vital? Because the majority of the work the Supreme Court does is, is review the work of circuit judges. If you'd be comfortable with a lifeguard that's never been swimming or a range master that's never fired a weapon, then you can go out and vote for someone else. But I'll tell you this. I've stared the murderers in the eye before I sent them to prison for life. I've shared the joys of adoption with people. I have dealt with the sorrows of families who have lost loved ones and victims and crimes. One thing I will never forget is the decision a judge makes every day is, has a significant impact on one of our citizens whether it be a Supreme Court case or whether it be a circuit court case or a magistrate court case. And what happened in Charleston is they forgot they worked for the people, they forgot that their decisions needed to be based upon the law and the facts, not upon personal or ideological differences or views. You don't have to wonder how I'll be as a Supreme Court Justice. You can look at over 25 years of decisions I've made as a circuit judge. The reason voters have returned me time and time again to the bench is because they know that they can have a case in front of me and it will be decided impartially, purely on the law and the facts. I have support from both sides, ideologically, conservatives and liberals, plaintiff's lawyers, defense lawyers, and why? Because consistency and predictability is what we need on the court, and I provide that. I roll up my sleeves and I go to work every day. So I'd ask that the voters please consider casting their vote for me so that we can return integrity to the court. Thank you. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of the West Virginia Bar Association, I'd like to depart from the program just briefly and on behalf of our association and all the folks 
who are watching statewide, those people who are here, we appreciate beyond belief your willingness to come here before a camera, before the public, and to take unscreened, uh, unreviewed questions and put forth your position for the court. We, uh, we withheld our uh, applause and recognition before. I'd also like to recognize our panel. Uh, Dean Bowman came down from Morgantown this afternoon through horrendous traffic and arrived here by the, in the nick of time. Uh, of course, our Jeff Jenkins, you gotta remember, is the uh, head of the largest statewide news organization. So we now are gonna conclude this uh, presentation. We have a reception in the Grand Lobby where you can stay. We have some refreshments, some hors d'oeuvres, and mingle with the candidates. But I would like for all of us who are present to express our appreciation of those And now we're adjourned signing die, right? <laughs> Absolutely.